When our best fur friends leave our world, many of us are left wanting one last scritch, one last hug, one last walk together. One Last Network is a space for pet guardians to honor their pets in their senior years and to cope with the days leading up to and after their passing. Here's your host, Angela Schneider, founder of One Last Network and Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington. Welcome to One Last Network and the art of joy and pain. One Last Network has a mission to provide you with the support and services you may need as your pets enter their twilight years and ultimately leave our physical world. We are all pet photographers at One Last Network, and we are one of the services we encourage you to find so that you create beautiful, everlasting memories of the love you have for your best fur friend. Many of us, too, have become educated in what grief means and how we can best support you as you walk a path with your pet, which can be overwhelming, confusing, and emotional. I became a pet loss grief companion through Two Hearts Pet Loss Center and a grief educator through David Kessler and Grief.com, so I could teach my fellow pet photographers to do just that. We have a profound appreciation for the love you have for your pets. Many of us have loved and lost. And we can play a unique role in your support system as you're taking these last adventures with your beloved pet. We can be your shoulder to cry on when it feels like you have no one else in your life to understand. At your photo shoot too, we know how to strike a balance between all the things you're feeling, the sorrow, the pain, the confusion, and how to celebrate the life of your pet and the deep bond you've created with that being. That's what we're talking about today, that delicate balance I've gathered some of the photographers of One Last Network, and many of them are now pet loss grief specialists, together to chat about how we approach our end-of-life photography sessions so that you have beautiful artwork and images and support in your grief. You will hear from Kylie Doyle of Kylie Doyle Photography in Sacramento, California, Courtney Bryson of CM Bryson Photography in Atlanta, Georgia, Jessica Wasik of Bark and Gold Photography in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Chris Miller of Mill Pet Photography in Berkshire, United Kingdom. Jen Wilson of Jen Wilson Pet Portraiture in Kitchener, Ontario. Nicole Rustic of Portraits by Nicole in Las Vegas, Nevada. Darlene Woodward of Panthetown Photography in Georgetown, Massachusetts. Lynn Sainert of Lance and Lily Photography in Loudoun County, Virginia. And our newest pet loss grief specialist, Lisa Peterson of Posh Photos in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Have a listen. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are talking about how we, as professional pet photographers, balance supporting our clients who are in anticipatory grief with celebrating the life of their pet and creating long-lasting memories that they will cherish. So I'm going to throw a question out there and get y'all to just jump in and uh, take turns, of course. Uh, But uh, how do you approach pet photography sessions with sensitivity and compassion when pets are near the end of their lives? Well, for me, particularly since having gone through the grief training, that approach has changed entirely because Initially, I was running everybody through the same workflow, and it was a great, happy, wonderful celebration. We're going to have so much fun. I can't wait. My end-of-life clients may not be, like, thrilled to have to do this. It may be meaningful to them, but it may not be something that they're looking forward to as this puppy party awesome celebration. So I ended up having to change my tone in terms of my emails, the guides I was providing them the timeline that I was giving them this information in and just making it more sensitive to how they may be feeling because we don't know. Some people may be excited, but I would say the majority are not really looking forward to this. It's something that they want to do, but it's not out of an, out of a fun reason to do it. Right. Yeah. And I'd like to add to that as well, if I can, Um, I agree completely with Jess that, for me, the workflow changed 
after the training and certainly uh the rainbow bridge session as i called it before the training that i'd done i was much focused on um, running it the same way as i did with any other client and as jess said the frame particularly of this uh customer uh he 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 literally had the final visit to the vet due a couple of days later and i was turning up compassionately in terms of what i was saying but what i'd sent beforehand was a whole series of very happy emails and trying to get you excited for the event and what's changed since is that i now focus on one last magical adventure and so if we really are looking at an end of life photography session then it's one last magical adventure that i'm talking about and that isn't a series of emails that's just one communication and one focus around if there's one thing we could do to make this a magical adventure for you and your dog, what would that be? And we try and discuss that very quickly if we can, and then work our way through that. And my focus then becomes much more on capturing the bond and the connection between the owner and not just trying to get lots of happy pictures, which was what I was doing before the training. Another thing too, um, that especially for me changed after going through the grief training is really just reading the client more and coming to them on that same energy level that they're at, you know, because some end of life clients, they may still, you know, be happy and, and in that celebratory, you know, wanting to make this a really fun, exciting experience. Um, you know, and some of them may be on the other end of that, but I think just listening to them and the words that they're using and you know where their energy is at and trying to meet them in that same space. Yeah, I would agree with Kylie. It's like I definitely listen more to my client and I also get a lot more seniors who are not quite to that end of life stage. So we're able to still have um, a more relaxed session and the you know we know it's not immediate but even with my immediate my clients where i know the pet will be passing away shortly it, it is about reading the client and i had a session with this earlier this year where the client was our dog trainer and so because i knew her better than i i know most of my clients i was able to read her um but she also in she said to me she liked having those couple of hours where she didn't have to think about what was going to happen. And so I, we, you know, um, my husband assisted me that day. And, and so because we knew her, we were able to make it a more personal session for her and for her dog and what she wanted. And it really is like Kylie mentioned, it is about playing off of their energy and, one thing I, again, um, others have mentioned it, I definitely make my sessions more about the connection with the pets and their guardians. And so my focus is changing more to include a lot more photos of the pet parents as well, showing that beautiful connection they have and showing activities they like to do together. What are some other ways you might personalize the photography session to really show off the personality of the pet and that bond? Well, I think in the case of my trainer, I asked, you know, what are some of their favorite activities? And she mentioned, you know, because she's a trainer, they love training together. So we incorporated in her session photos where she was doing one of her favorite things was having her dog weave through her legs and so we we got those photos and so i think by during the consultation asking what are some of those favorite activities they like to do and i definitely try to incorporate those more into their session if we and at a favorite spot they enjoy going to as well where the dog is generally more comfortable than in a new space. Because so many of us have experienced grief, it is certainly not something that is unique to the human experience. 
do you feel you're able to connect to your clients on a different level? And Jess, yes, anticipatory grief is included in this question. <laughs> I was going to say, I've not, we had our childhood dog, but to me, that is a very different loss than what I'm going to experience with Hunter. So I can't say that I have felt the type of immediate impending anticipatory grief that some of my clients have. Maybe they've gotten that diagnosis earlier that week, but it's definitely caused me to just think about how people are feeling. You know, you get this news and it's not going to be signing off an email, have a great day. They're not having a great day. They've got crap news and they're going to feel like just kind of embracing that yucky feeling. So I'm a little bit more sensitive to that now, whereas before I was just always trying to go about being like real positive. And I think it's okay to remind them that this is both a happy and a sad thing. It doesn't have to be either or, and they can exist at once. And there can be moments of happiness when we are feeling this grief that we may not expect. And it's not anything to feel guilty about, just as there's times where they may look at their dog during that session and it just hits them, this wave of sadness. I think kind of like with what uh, Jess said, this kind of duality of being able to feel both things at the same time and being able to let your client feel like it's okay to feel both things at the same time has been really kind of changing for me. Like within the hour to two hours that I get to spend with them and their dog in person at our session, we kind of get to go from being kind of almost like laughing at something silly that the dog has done to crying while she's snuggling him in the next instant um, and kind of experiencing that duality and letting them know that that's okay and holding that space for them has been really important for me. What are some effective ways to create that atmosphere where we give our clients the space to feel joy and pain at the same time. So I'm pretty new to this, right? I've only done a couple end of life sessions, but for me, I just let them know up front. They'll probably experience lots of things. And I kind of go with them on that journey and let them do what they need to do and feel what they need to feel and just let them lead it. I think really what Lisa said, you know, when we, when I have my planning call with these clients and we're talking about part of it is that they want to share like what they're going through with their dog, whether they've received a really bad diagnosis or age is just catching up. Um, and you want to be there to listen to those hard things. You also, part of this conversation is talking about the things that they love the most about their dog and the funny things that they do. And I usually ask them to tell me like their favorite story of something that they really feel connected to their dog when they do. And then when we get to the session, it's the same thing. It's like, we're going to talk about some of the really funny things that they do and this great relationship that you have. And we're also going to talk about, I kind of have to feel these, all of these last moments that kind of lead up to losing our pets. We're always, you know, this is the last time we're going to do this. This is the last time we're going to do this. And those are kind of really bittersweet moments that we just have to kind of hold space so that they get to feel them and let them know it's okay to feel those. And if it's not a problem, if, if we're crying or if we're laughing or whatever it is that we need to do. Thanks for hitting on the storytelling aspect of that, Courtney. I think it's really important that we continue to ask our clients a lot of questions and help remind them that the memories they've created with their pets are what will carry them forward to a space of healing. And, and we don't have to actually voice those words and say, your memories are what's going to help you heal, blah. But to re just to remind them that the memories are so important, even the memories that we are creating in this space here today at their end of life session. 
Well, I think for a lot of people too, getting to speak with us is one of the times that they get to talk about their dog kind of without this expectation of like, okay, well, when is this conversation going to be over? You know, it's just a dog. It's just a pet that we feel a lot when we talk about grief with people that don't have these kinds of relationships. Um, so I think kind of being that person for my client that they can, you know, if we need to spend an hour while they tell me something that's really important to them and their pet, not only am I here to hear it for them, I want them to tell me those things. I want to be, you know, an easy ear for them to kind of unload these things on. Absolutely. Kind of feels like, I don't know, like it's a sacred space because we're like a safe person who also loves dogs. And I think it's probably a rare thing that they kind of seek out people who will understand their complete devastation and complete devotion to this dog who they love so much because we automatically get that by our profession, right? So uh, it seems an honor to be in that space. That's a lovely way to put it. Thanks, Lisa. This is an interesting topic for me that I, I just don't really think of, I guess, because I'm only surrounded by dog people who love dogs. So I guess it doesn't even cross my mind that somebody else might not have that around them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's an interesting, I guess an important thing that I need to start thinking about because it doesn't cross my mind at all that there are such humans <laughs> out there <laughs> that don't, you know, that don't value dogs in the same way. It, it is a, it is a weird space for sure. But we have to remember that it is a large part of grieving to feel shame about our grief because we live in a grief illiterate society and Along with that, pet loss grief is certainly one of the key facets of disenfranchised grief where a lot of the world does not understand how we can love a dog or a cat or a horse or what have you that much. And we people don't always receive the kind of support in their greater world. And that's why we started One Last Network to make sure that people start to understand that it's okay for people to love a dog that damn much, right? It's interesting to see the difference too between people who've had multiple pets and then lost multiple pets and clients for whom this is the first pet they've lost and how surprised they seem to be sometimes with the level of grief they're experiencing or anticipatory grief they're experiencing there they didn't expect to get so attached they didn't expect to love so much um and it's it's kind of always interesting just to see them be so surprised about it really interesting point jen thanks for bringing that up Cause I'm like, how could you not be surprised? Like this is just animals are perfection. But I know that a lot of people we don't have experience with an animal until they're much older. You know, they grew up in a house that pets weren't allowed. It wasn't affordable, whatever. Or, you know, maybe their spouse decided to get whatever the situation they've never had that experience until, you know, maybe mid adulthood oh, and are completely blindsided by all these emotions and thoughts and trying to put it all into some kind of perspective and then not be overwhelmed by the counter advice from people who are doing the whole it's just a dog thing so i think there's a lot of their own work that they need to do sometimes mm -hmm. but, and i think a lot of us in the room are are gen x and um we come from a world where pets were a little more disposable mm -hmm. at least when we were kids yep. and the world is changing millennials and and gen z are certainly more attached to their dogs and consider them family members we as adults found our way into the dog world 
And I certainly was surprised by how much I fell in love with Shep. How do you handle more emotional moments with your clients in the midst of your consultation and your session? I am not a very touchy feely huggy person. Like I, I try very hard not to physically shrink back when a client is like, Oh, can I have a hug? Cause I'm my first reaction is no, thank you. But I know some people are very huggy. So sometimes that's what they want. They want the, the arm across the shoulder. They want a hug. They want something others don't. And I'll be like, I'll try to ask them, you know, did you want a hug or do you want to just stop and sit for a minute or whatever I think they might want to do at that moment. It's very hard to kind of figure out when you don't know them that well, it's hard to figure out what they need, but I just usually ask them. And I'll pipe in. I'm a complete mush. And if anyone knows me, yes, I cry. I'm emotional. I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, People who reach out to me though, and have looked at my website. My story is on there. I'm completely vulnerable. Everything is out there. And I think they get a sense of connection and feel that, oh, Darlene, I can really, you know, talk with her, tell her stories, kind of relate to her. And I think that is the type of client that I do draw because I think we put out to the world those type of people that we want to you know draw into us and all that so yes I know when not to cry but yes I'm one who will sit and cry with a client and bond in that way I think yeah I never got that off of you most of my clients tend to be sort of the more analytical I mean there's you can still tell they're very sad but they are much more reserved typically so I think we definitely do resonate with the people who who want to work with us because they sense that we're more like them. I mean, I I definitely have shed tears with my clients, but I also think they just want that space to be able to talk. And Mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's a lot of it's, you know, it's like, it's okay. I understand just, you know, letting, letting them have that space to talk about their experience, talk about, what's going on with their pet. I think they just want, a lot of times they just want someone to understand what they're going through and listen to them. Aside from Lynn, who launched Lance and Lily Pet Photography with the intention to serve clients in their senior years or with end of life sessions, How many of us actually got into this business expecting we were going to be supporting people who are in grief? Yeah, I see a lot of heads shaking. You know, Mill Pet Photography, the website is happy working cocker spaniels flying over logs and and puppies. And it's, it's all happy, smiley stuff because that's the majority of what, I try to photograph and trying to give clients, but you're absolutely right. It's how do you also show that you are, you do have empathy and actually you can capture the the moments, maybe the final moments that are are so essential. And it was for that reason that it wasn't a different brand, but I created one last magical adventure as almost a separate website, which it is just so there's somewhere to point people. And then it talks all about one last network and everything else. And so that's where I can kind of connect as we all can others in our network. And of course, being UK based, I have to use some of the different uh, local councillors as well to, to, to get us there. So for me, it made me really realise that you I couldn't easily put the two things together. Um, and by having the separate website, it does mean that I can really quickly help clients and even help people who aren't going to ever be my client. There's people on LinkedIn who message almost every day with my dog's just passed. And, you know, I, 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 I heartfelt understand the quote you've just made and I can quickly point them. In fact, there was one just, I think yesterday or the day before I pointed them directly to one last network because that was what was needed. And they're not in the UK and it's too late. The dog has already crossed, but they need help. And and I felt I can't do much other than just help connect. So 
it's it's helped me realize that you can't always put the happy smiley things completely together sometimes it's it's good to separate i think it's fascinating that you know to your point about our society can't really deal with grief how in a regular session i will say to somebody not an end of life session just a regular session okay looking at me yeah now look at your pet and so many people say I can't. It reminds me of the day they're not going to be here. I can't go there. Like they can't even do that. Really? And that's fascinating to me. So I don't, I don't, I'm still thinking about how I marry the two to Chris's point, but I, I don't know. I feel strongly that it's a part of life. Like it's a part of having your pet. Like, uh, yeah. I, and I, I don't disagree with anything that you're doing, Chris, but I, I just find it fascinating how the messaging is so strong that you just, you, like, mm -mm, nope, not going there. <laughs> With clients who struggle to that, what you just said, Lisa, I love candidates. And I found that my clients also really love the images where they're not expecting or they don't know that I took it. So I always have that camera ready and they may just be walking to a new spot or adjusting their dog's collar. And I snap that and they have no clue and I don't tell them, but I'll show it to them and it blows their mind that someone was able to see naturally what they feel toward their pet and it wasn't staged and it wasn't forced. And that's almost always the one they end up getting. Can I add another point, which I think um, it just helps. I think the title of today is Balancing Grief and a Celebration of Life. I have a client that I've managed to photograph their chocolate Labrador three times. Um, uh, once right back in the beginning 2018 uh, last year for Tales of Windsor and Ascot and this year for Tales of the World Volume 2 but this year when I photographed the seven-year-old lad I noticed that he was walking slightly awkwardly and the client said he's got some kind of rheumatism we're just getting in you know checked out and things at the moment and the client I'll be careful here the client told me just a couple of weeks ago it's actually cancer and it's just in the top of his front paw, uh, front leg. And he has to make the tough decision whether to remove the front paw so that they can possibly treat or, or, or not. And he's made the decision he's just going to go palliative care now, um, which is obviously a very difficult decision. And for me, it's actually really difficult as well, because I first photographed this dog when the gentleman was was meeting his partner and I've followed them as they've become a couple and they've had a child as well. And I've even got photographs just a couple of months ago with the children, the whole family and, and, and Harvey, the dog. Wonderful Labrador. But the reason I want to share, share this is that he's he called me to say I need to put on hold what I might want to buy from that session because I might want to buy something completely different. And I've just said, forget the commercial aspect. Just think about what's right for you. Let's get through these next few weeks and months and, and we'll come back. And maybe we create, if it's appropriate, a celebration of life for Harvey from a series of three different shoots. But what's what I wanted to share this for is that actually it can be quite, I think, supportive to not just focus on the end of life photography session that we're so often called for. If we've been lucky enough to capture multiple sessions with a client it could be that we can help create a celebration of life whatever that means and i have no engagement of any kind but i just thought i'd share that because i i have my first scenario here um where it's a current situation um we will do some kind of celebration of life and i don't know what that means yet but i don't think we necessarily have to take photographs at the very end it, it can be something on a journey on the way and we could still help create something special i don't delete anything and i don't necessarily tell all of my clients that but if they do come to me and say chief has passed do you still have absolutely i do or if they come to me as a repeat client for a celebration of life session, I will mention to them, I still have da 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 in the event you want to revisit that gallery too. And I will not charge an unarchiving fee for that service. Yep, same. I just did that actually. One of the dogs that I photographed a couple times uh, passed away just late last fall. 
and she wanted to see all of his images from over the years. So I, I got everything ready and she had sent some to her ex who was an original co-parent of the dog. Um, so yeah, I keep everything too, because you never know, right? Like, and they were glad they ordered some of the older prints too, like not just the new stuff we had taken, but some older ones. What are some tips you would give to a pet guardian on how to prepare for a celebration of life session? I usually um, let them know that the session will be fully guided by the dog, I guess, um, because I, every end of life session is a little bit different as far as the dog's mobility and what they're, they're able to do. I guess that's it. If the dog is um, still, I had one where the dog looked 100% normal, looked great and healthy, um, but it had cancer. And we ended up doing, you know, an, a normal session with some active stuff and some um, portrait stuff. And luckily that dog is still alive. And that was almost two years ago. Um, yeah, the cancer treatment was successful. Um, but then, you know, there's the dogs that are not at all able to pull that off. And so if, if the dog is struggling, then I will cut the session short if I feel like it's not comfortable. If the dog is at all uncomfortable, I'm not going to keep shooting, you know, that's kind of the only difference is I, I let them know that the dog will determine how long the session is and exactly what we are doing. So it's important to ask those questions during our get to know you phone calls or meetings, but then be able to adjust on the fly. Yeah. For sure. Because sometimes that changes between the, the phone call and the session, or sometimes the client isn't able to see just how bad the situation mm -hmm. is just, you know, it's, sometimes we don't want to see that. Um, so we kind of live in a little bit of denial. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I've broken up more, like quite a few sessions into two sessions because I'm like, your dog is very, very tired. No one's having fun anymore. I don't want this to be how they, how they remember it, how you remember it. So let's just close up shop right now and we'll do another one on another day when the, the dog has more pep and more energy. And clients are really good with that. They're like, oh, really? I was like, yes, of course. Like, I don't want your dog to be uncomfortable. That is 100% not my goal. And clients are really good with it. They don't seem to mind having to, you know, schedule a second one in. We usually do it within the next day or two because I know how time sensitive these sessions are. And they've all been really good about it. And it's, it, you can tell in the images, like you can see that towards the end of the session, the dog is just like, yeah, I'm done. And then you do it the next day and the, the dog is clearly perkier and happier. So it does make a difference in the images. To tie into this idea of a celebration, my advice to anyone considering booking this type of session would be to just do it. Don't worry if people are judging you because you're taking pictures of your sick or your tired or your dying dog. This hit home most when I interviewed one of my past clients. It was episode 24. And she said to me that for her dog, it was just another day. He wasn't feeling tired. He didn't know he was sick. He didn't know that he had any pain. And I think for her, seeing him just being a dog, doing the things he loves every day, getting to step away from the vet visits and the medication and the travel, uh, challenges they have at home, that really helped her in the healing process. Because having that memory then reflected in the products and images she bought, that's what she's remembering. She's not remembering pill bottles and trying to help him in and out of a car and the expenses of vet visits. So if you're considering doing this, it's okay to just follow your dog's lead. And if they're having the time of their life, just let them and be happy and enjoy the time that you have together. Yeah, uh, another great point, Jess. I, I did see someone post 
on their Facebook page not too long ago that dogs don't know they're sick. Dogs don't know they're dying. And it couldn't possibly be more incorrect. Dogs do know they're sick. Dogs do know they're dying. However, dogs live in the moment. And all they require of us is to be in that moment with them. And so it's certainly imperative that we allow our clients the space, the freedom, and the judgment-free zone to be present in that moment with their dogs and to forget about tomorrow's vet visit, to forget about the medications and the treatments and whatnot. Well, I think one thing I do, it's already kind of been said, I, you know, I let my clients know I can only do what your dog allows me to do. And, um, and I, and I tell clients, all clients, you know, the more relaxed you are, the more relaxed your dog is going to be because, you know, some of them are like, well, I want to be able to get this. I want to be able to get this. And, you know, I'm like, they, your dog is going to feed off of that. And if you're like high strung, they're going to feel that. And so I do tell them in advance, I'm like, you know, we're going to take our time. We're going to, I can only do what, you know, Fifi is going to allow me to do. Um, but we'll, we're just, we're just going to relax and go through it. And, and, and they usually calm down, but you know, you, you, you have like those, those high achievers. It's like, well, no, I want this. And it's like, like your, your, your dog can't walk. They, they're not going to do jumping shots. Come on. <laughs> I mean, that's a far example, but um you know, it's, but they're usually good with that once they kind of know, okay, we're, we're this is going to be a relaxed atmosphere. We're going to be able to, you know, get these shots, take our time. Like, okay, it's, it's all good. We're going to, we're going to trust Lynn and, and do what she says. <laughs> Surprisingly, I just got some great action shots out of a 13 year old golden retriever. <laughs> I know some of those dogs are surprising. They're, they're very surprising, but um, like my, my last client, the, the dog has neuropathy. So we were very limited on what we could do during the session in terms of movement. And one more thing about celebrating, I do tell people to bring the favorites. If your dog loves that stuffed moose and spends, you know, every day with it, we're going to put that moose in the photos with your dog. If your dog loves McDonald's drive through swing by on the way to the photo session and grab that cheeseburger for your dog to enjoy, because those things that are just going to make it a great day are so important. And also, if... I've also incorporated photos of other dogs and families that have passed away to add to the session in, you know, getting that celebration and including the entire family. So little things like that are important to remember. One thing I did recently that really touched my client's heart is that she had two pit bulls and they were both reactive to each other. So they could never, hi, Carol, I know you're listening. Um, they could never be in the same room together. And Carol and, and Jimmy spent almost 10 years living this life of keeping their dogs separate because they loved each dog so much. And they went to extra efforts to ensure both dogs were safe and comfortable. Mr. Wiggles died of cancer last August. And then Carol came to me and said, I don't want to miss out on more images of Betty. And I don't know how much longer I have. And I said, it, it, the one regret she had was that we couldn't get a really great picture of the two of them together. We tried. The first time we met, oh, we tried <laughs> and I had to Photoshop and I wasn't that good at Photoshop back then because it was in my early days. But I said, bring Mr. Wiggles. And she said, what? I said, bring Mr. Wiggles, bring him. And so she did. And we got a really lovely photo of Betty and Mr. Wiggles in his urn together. So it's just those little touches we can suggest 
like grab the bag of chicken McNuggets, bring the moose, you know, those little things that are really going to make your client look at the images and go, that was her. That was absolutely her. I think sometimes our expectations, we want to show clients all these fantastic photos. And then we wonder why, why didn't they pick those? Because, but we have to remember, we're looking at our photos differently than our clients do. Absolutely. And our clients, and that's why I sometimes, I tend to give a little bit more in my, especially with my um, end of life sessions, I tend to put more in those galleries because they're going to want to select those photos that capture their dog differently. And it's, you know, and I always tell my clients, I said, you are going to know your dog more than I ever will. And um, so I add more photos to those galleries. So, cause they'll see something in their dog. That's like, you know, that's him. That's my dog. And I'll, and it'll be a, it'll still be a great photo, but it wouldn't necessarily be from my photographer's point of view of like, this is awesome. Great. Fantastic. But that's their dog. And, and that's, I think sometimes people forget it. it's like our job is to give them photos of their pets as they are. And, you know, we, we see, we see things differently, but we have to present to our clients a lot of different images so they can choose the photos of their dog as they remember them. Yeah, exactly. There, there's, you almost have to concentrate more on the non-technical aspect. Um, and there are photos that I've certainly given clients that are technically probably really not that good, but they're their favorite images. Like they'll put up with the noise because their dog is lying in their bed in the corner with his head on the stuffy like he always does. It's not framed well. It's, well, you know what I mean? It's, I look at it and go, oh, but it says so much to them that they're just like, that's my boy. So those are the really important ones to, to make sure you include. Exactly. And I think, you know, as Jess said, it's like, I tend to, with, especially with those sessions, they are more candid together shots. I mean, I might, might say it's like, oh, you know, get together or whatever, but it's those candid moments that also are, I'm, they're not going to be, you know, like I, I've said before, it's like, they're not going to be concerned if their hand positioning is right. They're going to know that, oh yes, this is me loving my dog. This is how I remember my moment with my dog. Well, I think some of that goes back to even talking to our clients as we're planning. I photographed um, a senior Maltese a couple of months ago and when we were talking, her mom was telling me that at her last dental, she had lost her two bottom canines. So she just had these three tiny teeth at the bottom of her mouth. And she called them her chiclet teeth. <laughs> and like the the photo um, that she really ended up falling in love with that we printed large for her house is not a great portrait of her dog because it's the moment when she looked up at me and like her tongue is flopped to the side and you can see these three chiclet teeth that she's so attached to that I would have never like going through my images if I was looking just for artistically technically correct portraits it would have been a discard but because I had talked to her and I knew what those chiclet teeth meant I was like this one has to go in, you know, if I have to do some extra things to, to save where the eye's not perfectly sharp because the dog is moving and the tongue's flopping everywhere. Like I can do that extra work on that image because I know how important it is before she even gets to see it. What are some things a pet guardian needs to look for in their pet photographer? when it comes to celebration of life sessions? I think it's really important to look for someone who not only has the experience and the knowledge, um, but is willing to meet them where they're at. You know, it's, it's a journey for everybody going through this grief process, and it's gonna be different for everybody. So finding somebody who's able to understand 
understand where you're at in that process and is able to, you know, just meet you there instead of trying to, you know, put expectations on you or, you know, trying to kind of put you in a box. Yeah, there's a difference between finding someone who can pick up a camera and take a picture of your pet versus someone who can take that photo conveying what that dog means to you and what these images are ultimately going to mean to you as well. And so I know for me, like this grief training has changed everything for me. Like, I feel like that's truly what sets me apart from other pet photographers and family photographers who are comfortable incorporating dogs. It's just a different level of care and understanding and patience and process that we've been trained in from start to finish that extends beyond really the photo session as well. So important that your pet photographer prints. You're going to want that album. You're going to want that portrait on the wall. And I can say this from personal experience. After I lost my dog Coda last year, I couldn't get enough pictures printed and displayed in my house. You may think you want all the digital files and just digitals, but I guarantee you are going to want to flip through that book. You're going to want to put everything on the wall. So that is extremely important. Yeah, no, I just completely agree. Um, it, it is about printing and seeing those things. But I think there's also a timing. I know when um, Hugo, the uh, the bulldog that um, I did a couple of years ago, I, I did those. I created a, a, an album, some wall art. Um, the client, you know, within a couple of weeks, made it clear they couldn't pick that up and did not want to see that for a while obviously not a problem not, not an issue but it took three months before they were ready to see that in person again and and I think to Darlene's point had it just been digital files they could have had those and never opened those things maybe for a long much longer but I, I now know and, and still do keep in touch with that client um, they value that print work so much uh, so so it so it is I think we just have to also be appreciative that it it might not be immediate that they can necessarily pick them up same goes for even looking at their gallery right yeah that there there sometimes may need to be some grace and some space given before we rush them into seeing their gallery absolutely oh uh, yeah same thing I, I think just um being more, yeah, giving them the space, the grace, and the meeting them where they're at, and telling them that, um, like I saw, I, I've had a client who it took them six months to view the gallery and another six months to open the canvas. That's fine. Like, uh, if that's what it takes, that's fine by me. I have no expectations for any kind of turnaround for um, for sessions like this, and I let them know that right away. And I also let them know. I typically don't um, want to set up payment plans for regular clients, but for um, end of life sessions, 100% payment plans are fine because I know end of life vet care is very expensive. Um, so I guess I just let them know I'm a little more flexible with everything, with timing, with session length, with splitting a special session up, with viewing galleries, with all of that stuff. How has doing end of life sessions changed you as a photographer? I think one of the reasons that I got into pet photography in the beginning, although my business was not built around end of life, was after experiencing with the foster work that I do, kind of this really accelerated timeline for pets of their life. So, like even right now, I have 11-week-old puppies in my house, and I have a 17-year-old husky foster, too. I always wanted to kind of capture that kind of, I don't know, like this bittersweet in between of loving pets. And that's what my photography has always been about. Um, you know, capturing who this dog is, creating something that you can hold on to that doesn't change and doesn't fade or go away um, is why I've always wanted as a pet photographer to create tangible 
artwork. So I don't know that my photography has changed since offering end of life because I think that's something I've always done. I, I know my photography is leaning much more toward pets with their people and um, just being much more compassionate. And I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but just in general, I think because people know I have gone through the training, they will talk to me more about death in general, not just with their pets. And so I've, I've, they're like, oh, how do I help this person who is, you know, a death of a friend? How do I help them? So that training doesn't necessarily just stop with other pet people. It also, you know, I also have humans ask, you know, talking to me more about death and grief and, and the whole process as well. For me, it's made me fall in love with pet photography again. I kind of lost my mojo for a little bit there. And somebody reached out to me out of the blue and said, you know, my pet just got diagnosed. Can you come take photos? And I said, absolutely. Um, and it, she grabbed me in the driveway and said, can I hug you? And it just reaffirmed and kind of reinvigorated the reason, my why, if you will, <laughs> about why I do pet photography in the first place. Um, and it was a good reminder of like, okay, you know, your social media might be driving you crazy and these crazy people over here are making you insane, right? But this is why you do it. And that's really the focus. Yeah, I think I think for me, it's, uh, I agree very much with what, what Lisa just said. I have fortunately haven't lost my mojo, but I've only been at this for, what, five years, I guess, from a, from a dog perspective. Um, but I do feel that the, the, the real change for me has been, <laughs> um, and maybe it's the way Jess said it as well, um, should be a bit more uh, open that I'm going to take candid pictures through. But I will always make sure there are photographs with the owner now. And I, I think as we start to explain a little bit more why it's important, and, and these are sessions that are not even end of life sessions, just trying to get some of those connections those candid ones. And, and I think the most recent session I've done is only one year old dog. Um, so there's obviously no focus there. But this client um, asked me to come and photograph the one year old because unfortunately, their last dog, we never got to get the session done in time before it was too late. And um, I felt really bad and awkward about all of that but one years old we, we managed to take a picture of this also a session with the uh, this bichon poo uh lovely cross cross breed but the photos i took yes i blurred the owner in so many of the scenarios but she picked five of those to go in the album and you can see the connection even though she is not you know crystal clear in the pictures i kind of protected what she was trying to get which is i don't want to be in any of the pictures but she's got that connection. She can see the dog is running away, really, really happy from her. And she's in those. And there's a couple of obviously poor pictures in there as well. So I, I'm, I've am i learned to make sure that I do that and do that better. I can probably still learn better about how I explain that to someone. That's what I'm going to capture. But I think Jesse's point, maybe just capturing some more candid and then showing it at the viewing is probably enough for people who are just trying to say, I don't want to be in the pictures. It's so important to have them. And this is the guy who still only has one photograph of his first dog uh, and himself. Has doing these sessions changed the way you walk in the world? It has taught me to slow down. I'm a person who values efficiency. I'm like, all business, let's get the job done. But with this, like, I'm listening better. I'm slowing down the actual session. I'm taking the time to really understand why I do what I do, like how I can support these pet clients. And on a personal level, like it's encouraged me to photograph Hunter more. I've always photographed him, but it's become more important now that he's 14 because how many more years will we have to, to photograph him and whether he likes it or not, you know, tough. You're getting in front of the camera. And if you look lumpy, bumpy and grouchy today, that is who you are. And that's how I want to rem remember him. So for me, it's just taking some time. Oh, I hate to say it, but to not always be working and to just embrace what's happening right then and there, whether it's my clients or 
in my own personal life? I'd say it's definitely changed me. Um, I think a big thing is just, you know, having more grace and understanding that, you know, you don't always know what other people are going through and, you know, just letting people have the space that they need and, you know, the forgiveness that, you know, they could be having a really bad day. They could have just been told that their dog has cancer. You know, you don't know that. And so just kind of taking that space and, and letting people, you know, have a little bit of extra grace. What is one last piece of advice you want to leave with people who are thinking about an end of life session for their pet? Don't, don't, don't wait. wait. Jess, why not? I have seen far too often people who think they have time and I, in my gut, know they don't. And I'm pushing to try to move them forward. Let's, hey, let's bump it up a day or two. They're having a great day. Let's bump it up. No, I think we're having a great day. He'll be fine. And that session day rolls around and hours before he's passed. And there's there's no getting that time back. So don't wait, even when you have the good days. We know it's a roller coaster of emotions and health. Just book the session. Agreed. I think the last year, the decline is so fast. It just seems that the last year of life is for dogs goes fast and they decline so quickly that every day matters. And you never know what's going to happen. You know, you could be in a car accident tomorrow and you or your dog could be killed. So it's so important. Just get it done while you have the time. Thank you everyone so much for joining me today to chat about this important time in pet guardians lives. A pet photographer's expertise often extends well beyond her art and creativity. With empathy and understanding, she can be a pillar of support for you as you navigate the complex emotions associated with the impending loss of your best fur friend. Our goal is to create images that portray not only your pet's personality, but also the love you share. We can also create a space for you to feel the things or share stories you may not be comfortable feeling or sharing with the immediate people in your life. Our friends and family aren't always understanding of the loss we're facing when we receive a dire diagnosis for our best buds or have to schedule that final goodbye. This is a challenging transition you're facing and we can be your shoulder to cry on, your ear to listen, the one person who understands what you're going through. Together, we can create memories that one day hopefully make you smile through your grief and find healing because those photos will keep you connected to your pet and the love you shared through the years. It is one of the goals I had in mind when I founded One Last Network to teach photographers to understand grief better and to better support you in this painful time. If it is only a brief moment of solace we can bring you, it is at least one small respite from the heavy world of what you're facing. Next week, Kylie Doyle of Kylie Doyle Photography in Sacramento, California, interviews Dr. Masami Seplo of the Sierra Ranch Veterinary Clinic and Pet Rehabilitation Center in Roseville, California. They dig into rehab treatment and how it can be helpful for older pets to maintain mobility and happiness. Until then. I'm Angela Schneider, owner of Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington, and your host at One Last Network, signing off to go get some Bella Snuggles. Listen to One Last Network on whichever podcast platform you prefer. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you have a friend who might be interested in our content, make sure you share us with them. Thanks for listening.